Hello, hello. Greetings, everyone. Welcome once again to that channel, that show that covers all things World of Warcraft related uh, lore of Warcraft. Uh, happy to be here again on our last episode. We continued our long romp through classic World of Warcraft. We took our uh, night elf, Feral Druid, who's been running around meowing and scratching through Ash and Vale, and she continued that journey. Um, and we had a little bit of fun doing that, doing some rescuing and uh, some healing, some killing, you know, typical World of Warcraft fare. We've also been reading through, and I am I am uh, so excited to say this, we are not only on the, to bust this vocab work, word out in this context, we're not only on the penultimate episode of this book, we are on the penultimate chapter, penultimate episode of the entire Dungeons and Dragons side, like adventure journey epic that we've been going through. The this book, the last one, the Dungeons and Dragons source book is called Dark Factions. Um, we covered all the factions. We discussed things at length. We discussed troops. We just have a couple to go. Tonight's episode is going to be all about a, a final little mini bestiary that they've added in. So stay a while and listen as we look at just the last bit of creatures that they haven't given us stat blocks yet for. Similar to the last episode, um, a lot of the pages are going to be stat block heavy. We just kind of skip over those, but we'll read the flavor text and some descriptions and it'll take us a little bit of the way through and we'll finish up next time uh, we do one of these reading ones with a couple adventures. All right, so they call this creatures is the name of the chapter. A dark bestiary is what Bran Bronzebeard calls it. And it just basically talks about the independent races and factions and the creatures that are part of them. If they are intelligent, allies, or slaves, or if they're being made use of, if they're beasts of war, mounts, or maybe they're a little of both. So we're going to begin with the arachnophids. These, I think these are uh, those scourge things, if I'm, if I'm guessing, because it looks like they're situated in Northrend. Um, the crystal arachnophids are level one. The arachnophid Earth boars are level two, and the Overlord Arachnophids are level three. So these are not exactly super powerful beasts. Um, they're just described as a large, crawling, scorpion-like creature that scrambles forward, carapace gleaming white, and its wicked tail is raised for a strike. So they're kind of like Northrend scorpions. Arachnophid present one of the greatest unexpected dangers for unwary travelers in Northrend, particularly in the Ice Crown area. These crawling insectoid horrors possess a pair of powerful claws that rend and tear, as well as a poisonous sting that can prove fatal to much larger creatures. Though they do not possess intelligence, they have a cunning that seems to anticipate its enemy's moves and alerts it to their weaknesses. Arachnids are often found in groups, though they tend towards solitary attacks, except when in the presence of one of their mysterious overlords. There's a picture. So they are. They're kind of like this weird mixture of a scorpion and one of those, like, Scourge um, Anubarak type guys. They make their lairs underneath rocks, inside caves, or within shallow burrows. Arachnids that are territorial in the nature and generally don't pursue opponents beyond the area they consider to be theirs. Smart travelers and native creatures generally give Arachnids at a wide berth. They have no language as such, though they do seem to communicate with a series of chitters and clacks intelligible only to other Arachnids. Some scholars theorize that they're related to the scorpids, a species found in warm climates. Arachnids are not subtle combatants. They usually attack anything that moves within their territorial area. They use their powerful claws to rend their opponent's flesh, while their tails deliver a poisonous sting that incapacitates or kills their enemies. And that's it. They also have a little bit of, like, sneaking around. And a basic poison. The Arachnid earth borer, they remain beneath the surface of ice, snow, or earth until ready to strike. Experts on these creatures believe that as an arachnid that ages, it develops the desire to burrow and then becomes an earth borer. Arachnid that earth borers employ a similar attack to normal arachnid, though they usually announce their presence with the, their venomous barbs. They possess the claw and sting attacks common to all arachnid, and they can also fling barbs from their tails, so they have some uh, missile attacks as well. An earth borer usually launches a barb or two to weaken its enemies before closing. And the overlord arachnithids appear more heavily armored and much larger than other arachnithids. Some speculate that these are very old creatures by arachnithid terms who have developed their size, intelligence, and abilities over time. Others claim that 
overlords are created by eating special food in their larval stages and that they're born protectors and commanders of their arachnid colonies. They have a uh, they they can influence their um, fellow arachnid with an aura of command. Um, it just it it acts like their version of war drum. So they just basically give a buff. Plus, of course, they have poison. I don't know who they are minions of. It seems like they're kind of neutral beasts. All right, we have clockwork goblins. Clockwork. Um, these are level one little robos. I guess you'd make them. Some tinkers might. This creature resembles a mechanical goblin, sort of. It's obviously of inferior workmanship. It bounces up and down the sounds of rusty gears echo from within, and steam shoots from crevices. A large key turns on its back, making it look like a giant wind-up toy with a red hat and goggles. It swings a spear with its left hand, but it shows in the picture it's actually a wrench, not a spear. That's drawn by Seder. We've seen a lot of his artwork. Clockwork goblins are poorly made soldiers that explode after a set period of time. They're some of the first creations an intermediate goblin tinker makes when he experiments with self-ambulatory devices. They are useful as an exercise, but not so much as real soldiers. The design's original specifications seem an error, for after a short period of time the goblin shuts down. Rather than redrafting the blueprints, some enterprising goblin in the past just made a few adjustments to that rather than shut down, the clockwork goblin explodes, making it a sort of mobile bomb. Clockwork goblins go where they are programmed to go. What this usually means is that the tinker sets up an inner, an inner, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> an inert clockwork goblin or row of them, and when the time is right, activates it. The clockwork goblin bumbles along in a generally forward direction. After a period of time which the tinker sets when he activates the goblin, the mechanism detonates. Clockwork goblins are simple, simple devices. They're capable of following specific targets, moving along the ground and making up 360 degree turns, and swinging their spears, but that's about it. Uh, and they detonate. That's the only power they really have. And they, they kind of describe how tinkers, what kind of DCs you would need to craft them and operate them. Um, and they can also, of course, malfunction, which just means the second that you arm them, they immediately explode. Coaddles, we've read some about this. I, I can't remember. One of the things we recently read talked about, like a mission where you'd want to get some coaddles. Uh, I, I can't remember where they say they appear. Maybe this flavor text will help us. But these are... Level 6 creatures, so they're stronger than the things we've just read about. The creature is an immense winged serpent bearing horrible fangs dripping with venom. Its head plumage extends in two long rows down its back, and its tail ends in an equally brilliant feather display. Distantly related to wind serpents, coaddle are rare creatures of great strength. Coaddle are distinguished from their smaller cousins by their immense size, nearly twi twice the length of a normal wind serpent and the brilliant display of bright yellow and green plumage across their heads and backs in two long rows. Their shorter feathered tails serve to further distinguish them from wind serpents. Lastly, their wings are much greater and bear more feathers. Coatl nest in trees and crags dotting the coasts of Azeroth. Some are venomous, some are magical, some are both, and some are neither. Coatl occasionally disrupt magic, which makes some people think that they have an understanding or intelligence of it. This idea is incorrect. Coatl are non-sentient animals. Recently, Naga have returned to the surface of Azeroth and domesticated Coatl. The Naga breed these tamed Coatl in order to optimize the lethality of their venom and train them to be fiercely loyal to their Naga masters. Coatl attack with blinding speed, spitting acid before descending for the kill. They counter obvious magical threats with a dispel magic ability. Yeah, we'll have to play, like, I don't know where you encounter these in Classic, but I, I mean, I, I definitely have encountered them, but I just can't remember off the top of my head where you might encounter them. Um... They also have poison. They have a venom spray as well. There are also non-magical coatl. Um, They're just a natural version. They The only thing is they, they just can't cast a spell magic. Other than that, they're pretty much the same. Okay, general chromatic dragons. We've definitely covered this. I mean, regular D&D covers this, but I guess if you wanted to just, like, fight them. They give stats for whelps, which are level 6, and drakes, which are level 17. And I guess it doesn't really matter what color you pick. Modeled purple scales cover this dragon. The look in its eye is frightening, and the word insane seems sufficient to describe the dragon's features. Though it would likely stand as tall as a human man if fully stretched out, the dragon is curled slightly forward as if perpetually wincing in pain. Oh, look at this thing. I've seen some of these, but yeah, I can't remember again where we fight them. We haven't fought them yet. These unnatural creatures are the product of decades of research on the part of the black dragonflight. 
While Deathwing aimed to create chromatic dragons years ago, this desire constituted much of his mo motivation for attacking Grim Batal. He was never able to catch enough eggs to succeed. His son Nefarian has recently succeeded to an extent, creating dozens of these chromatic dragon whelps, young dragons with the properties of all five dragon flights. Raised in captivity, they know only servitude, although highly intelligent. None of these whelps has the power of cunning to break Nefarian's grasp on their minds. Chromatic dragon whelps are fearless in combat, not having learned the value of their own lives. They rotate through their breath weapons in hopes of finding a weakness in their enemies using their claws to attack in between breaths. So this is not chromatic in a generic template sense. This is like dragons that possess all, all the, some traits of all five flights. Chromatic dragons possess the breath weapons of each of the five flights. So they, they describe that at, at, when they can use it, and then they have to wait one to four rounds, and then they can use it again. Uh, they also have some spell-like abilities, and they are considered both cold and fire, so it kind of cancels each other out. Uh, so all in all, they just don't have any resistances or weaknesses. The purple, This purplish dragon, uh, this is up, upping it to the drake, stretches out its wings and neck, clearly preparing to hunt. There's something unnatural about the patterns of its scales and the expression on its face. The creature seems somehow underdeveloped. Chromatic drakes are a rare breed, only a few exist because Nefarian's research has not yet been going on long enough for it to have produced any chromatic adults naturally. The only chromatic drakes that do exist presumably have been aged by some unnatural means. Regardless, Nefarian has created only a handful of these monsters, and they are undoubtedly among the deadliest of all dragons, if not all living creatures in general. Like the younger dragons of their flight, chromatic drakes' minds are bent to Nefarian's will, and they serve him loyally and without question. And they also speak uh, draconic, but they can speak common unlike the whelps. Chromatic drakes fight with the same general tactics as chromatic dragon whelps using different breath weapons until they find the one that's most effective. Additionally, some are trained to use magic to augment their attacks and defenses, but they focus on melee after a few spells, buff up a little bit and attack, and they kind of describe those. Dragon turtles, I really feel like we've had some of these before. These are also a regular D&D &D staple. Um, these are from Warcraft 3, the, the Naga used them. They're, le they're a level nine creature. If you ever thought turtles were slow and unimpressive, this creature proves that thought wrong. Though squat, it stands 10 feet high, and its red skin and spined black shell give it a primal and fearsome appearance. Dragon turtles are an enormous red-skinned black-shelled variety of sea turtle. Some Naga captured and trained a few dragon turtles to augment their soldiers, but this tactic is not widespread. They have an improved grab. They can then swallow whole if they are successful, and they have a spiked shell. So if you hit it, you hurt yourself. All right, Hobgoblins, which is just a standard D&D fair, and here is a weird thing that has to get its own special monster stat thing. They are level three creatures, and they resemble a goblin, but are much taller, about seven feet and bulkier. Its skin is purple, and its confused look betrays a dim-witted nature. I really don't know. I don't think that these... I thought hobgoblins were those ogre-ish looking things that fight for the goblins. Um, but I don't know, maybe there are also hobgoblins I, we just need to see in-game yet. Hobgoblins are stupid, brutal troops that goblins created with their mad alchemy. Goblins created hobgoblins by experimenting on their own kind. The alchemically wrought changes in hobgoblins did more than increase their size and strength and decrease their mental faculties. Perhaps the most well-known fact about them is their short lives. If a hobgoblin lives in his, to his third year, he's ancient. Hobgoblins either don't realize their lives are pitifully short, which is likely due to their limited intellect, or they don't care. Hobgoblins could also alter their personal metabolisms, channeling their adrenaline into the muscles that most need it. Their sweat is acetic, and they're capable of bursts of amazing speed that will reduce them to unconscious piles. It's like suffering levels of fatigue. One frightening change the alchemy wrought was on hobgoblin emotions and psychology. Hobgoblins are unstable, and their goblin masters find them difficult to control. They have a number of tactics, ranging from the violent to the culinary, to convince hobgoblins to obey. But because of this instability, goblins use hobgoblins only rarely. Hobgoblins grunt out phrases in common and goblin. Hobgoblins are bred to obey their goblin masters, and they do so. They are brutal and stupid. A hobgoblin's preferred tactic is to charge, howling ferociously and pound away. And that's uh, in indicated in their blitz move. They also have that seething sweat, so it's basically uh, kind of like a thorns buff on them. Um, and they really go into description on that. Oh, uh, yeah, it says that 
They also have flammables. That 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 sweat, in addition, is flammable. They also like to tackle, and they can transmogrify, like we just said. So they can buff their arm, they can, which makes that arm hit harder. They can buff their legs, which makes them faster and jump. They can buff their torso, which gives them more life. And uh, and it's only a temporary buff, so that's kind of neat. All right, so the Makrura. There's the Makrura Prawn, which is like a weaker level 2 Makrura. We basically probably fought these before. This creature looks like a giant lobster, though its legs are proportionately longer and its head is raised like a snake preparing to strike. Its face does not convey the same look of readiness, however, rather displaying a weary resignation. Its clacking claws belie this expression. Makrura Prawns are large lobster-like creatures that tear prey apart with their claws. They are a type of Makrura, and other Makrura place great value in Makrura Prawns. Makrura Prawns train as animals of war. Makrura Prawns also act in Makrura settlements as guard dogs do for humans. Okay. In their natural habitats, Makrura Prawns are unremarkable. They spend their days moving slowly across the ocean floor or rocky beaches scavenging for food. Despite their large claws, Makrura Prawns are scavengers rather than hunters as they don't have the speed to bring down anything faster than a garden slug. The seafloor is a good spot for scavenging, though, since most everything that dies in the water sinks to the bottom. Some of it washes up on beaches, so Makrura prawns frequent those areas as well. Most Makrura prawns live in saltwater, but freshwater varieties exist and both taste excellent. In their natural habitat, Makrura prawns are not aggressive. They are large enough to intimidate rival scavengers and use their claws primarily for tearing dead food into smaller chunks. However, when a Makrura prawn encounters rivals for a piece of food, it advances menacingly, well, as menacingly as these creatures can, and strikes with its claws to drive the intruder away. Often the intruder is another Makrura prawn. Makrura prawns also fight in defense if they cannot escape. Other Makrura train Makrura prawns to be more aggressive. Under a skilled handler, a Makrura prawn confronts enemies. They serve better as guard beasts than as attack creatures. However, as do other Makrura. A typical Makrura tactic is to remain away from an enemy, allowing their tide callers and other spellcasters to pummel them with spells and draw them into melee. Then the Makrura warriors and prawns attack. Makrura prawns are also a favored summoned creature of Makrura spellcasters, and they are delicious in butter. They can constrict and, and grab. The Murgle, these are like the little weird murloc type things. Um, regular Murgle are level 1, and magical necromancer Murgles are level 9. There's a little picture of them. This we fought before. This humanoid has a thick, warty skin, webbed extremities ending in claws, and bulbous eyes that have a feral gleam. A row of needle-sharp teeth pokes from its frog-like mouth. A few long spines jut from its back. Murgle are vicious, murloc-like aquatic humanoids. Scholars speculate as to their origins. Some say that these creatures were once murlocs, but the Burning Legion's powers cursed and twisted them. While Murgle resemble Murlocs to a degree, they are far more vicious and bloodthirsty and dangerous. Murgle delight in capturing both humans and Murlocs and anyone else, torturing and then eating their victims. They infest the sea, clambering aboard vessels and slaying everyone on board. Murgle form small groups, often but not always related. Such gangs steal from one another, and Murgle raid nests of rivals for eggs to eat. Murgle organize in a spontaneous way, primarily to raid Murlocs or humans. If these raids go poorly, the Murgle may turn on one another. Murgle wander, and many do not even have a fixed territory. Lairs are temporary affairs used to hold prisoners or for mating. They keep only equipment they can either use or carry easily, though a temporary lair may have treasures from past victims. Like that of Murlocs, Murgle's skin color varies greatly from pale green to purple to turquoise to red. Their skin is warty and knob, not as smooth as a Murloc's. A Murgle's body usually bears spots and speckles of a contrasting color. Only a few races earn the Murgle's respect as foes, and the Naga are one of these. Murgle press any advantage. Their race includes healers and arcanists, and these characters use spells to slow and debilitate their enemies, allowing the Murloc warriors to close. They swarm over their enemies, tearing them to pieces and feeding on the battlefield. They're cunning and lure powerful enemies into water where they have a greater advantage. Murgle quietly tear at the bottom of ships and break rudders before attacking. Um... Yeah, so these are essentially demon murlocs. They're partially amphib amphibious. Uh, Murgle necromancers are specialized. Unlike most necromancers, necromancers rarely deal with the un with undead. Instead, they use their magic power over life forces to debilitate and slay their opponents. This is talking about the Murgle necromancers. Um, they have some spells. Now, you could actually hypothetically play as a Murgle, 
They're not as intelligent as other races. Murgle regularly train in the arts of both war and spellcasting. However, they fight with jagged swords and shields cobbled together from barnacle-covered driftwood. Murgle healers usually become priests, revering the powers of the depths, or perhaps Ajara, while Murgle arcanists are magi, necromancers are warlocks, because they have a history of dark magic. There's a little stat block for taking up to three levels in the Murgle racial class. Murgle are evil and ferocious creatures. They are also only partially amphibious. They must return to the water fairly often. Therefore, few Murgle depart from their society to become adventurers. Those who do earn the admiration of their fellows for Murgle delight in anything that causes pain to other creatures, which is surely what the adventuring Murgle is going to accomplish. So they get strength buffs, but they lose intellect and charisma. Somebody was telling me that in the latest iteration of Dungeons and Dragons, there are no more penalties for a race that you choose. So that's interesting. They're medium, um, Dark vision, little armor class bonus. They speak Nurglish. Uh, there, and when you take levels in Murgle, it just kind of shows you what you get for doing that. Most of the, this is all just D&D stats. All right, the Nerubians. Uh, we, I feel like we've talked plenty about these, but I, I guess they're giving us a couple more Nerubians. There are Nerubian workers, which are level four, and Nerubian spider lords are level fourteen. The large creature has the lower body of a giant spider with a humanoid torso. Its arms and head are spider-like. Its six spider legs are long and thin, allowing it to top 10 feet when it rears up. It wields a simple though wicked looking spear. The Rubians are cruel, intelligent spider people. They lurk in the cold shadows of Northrend, waiting with claws and spells to ambush intruders. The Rubians, along with their casts and their environs are detailed more thoroughly in Lands of Mystery. Oh yeah, so they just kind of talk about that. Nerubian workers avoid combat when pressed into service or when faced with destruction. However, they are disciplined, particularly if a skilled leader is present. Nerubians are proficient with all simple and martial weapons. They can also deliver a poisonous bite, but prefer the distance that wielding weapons offers, and they can also uh, shoot or lay a web. Uh, they also have frozen mind, kind of like being undead. Um, the Nerubian spider lords are enormous insectile creatures resembling a gigantic, fantastically colored beetle. There's a picture. The scarab-like carapace unfolds like dual wings, and the creature's front limb, limbs are scythe-like and bony. Nerubian spider lords, cold, ruthless, deadly, and intelligent beetle creatures, are perhaps the most powerful Nerubians. Spider lords once formed the majority of Azul Nerub's leadership. They were the keepers of law. They exhibit more callous intelligence than their underlings, and Nerubian spider lord is willing to sacrifice almost anything to further one of his complicated schemes. A Nerubian spider lord possesses the same poisonous bite of other Nerubians, but due to his scarab body, he cannot spin webs. Nerubian spider lords come in many vivid jeweled shades, everything from emerald green to sapphire blue to ruby red. Some scholars attempt to draw a correlation between a spider lord's coloring and his approximate power level, but so far have reached no consensus. Nerubian spider lords grow 18 to 20 feet tall and weigh 8,000 to 12,000 pounds. Their carapaces provide excellent natural armor, but their vestigial wings are not strong enough to allow flight. Only Nerubian queens give birth to spider lords. One out of every 20 eggs she lays on average grows into a spider lord. The rest emerge as regular Nerubians. They can speak common in Nerubian. A Nerubian spider lord, that's kind of a cool like scythe spear that he has, tries diplomacy first, after which he switches to his mind like abil his spell like abilities. Melee combat is a spider lord's last resort. They do not use web attacks, attacks like common Nerubians. Interesting. Okay, the Pandarin. Oh, we, they get stat blocks because, again, we're, we don't think of them as true PCs yet. The average Pandarin is just a level one regular dude. Uh, this creature is a humanoid panda bear. <laughs> it smiles and hefts a jug of ale with one hand and a stout sword with the other. Yeah, they're still kind of one-dimensional at this point. Um, but as we know, they become a very cool race in WoW. Hailing from the ancient and mysterious empire of Pandaria, the mighty Pandarin are agile warriors, wizened scholars, masters of earth magic, and peerless brewers. Little is known of their culture or society, though much is rumored. Historians believe that the Pandaran Empire is just as old as the Calderai civilization. They contend that Pandaran and Calderai traded both goods and ideas in the years before the War of the Ancients. However, as the Calderai grew more and more obsessed with arcane magic, the peaceful Pandaran withdrew and closed their borders. For ten millennia, the world had forgotten Pandaran. Shortly after the Third War, though, a few reappeared, perhaps roused from their isolation by the Burning Legion, whose catastrophic coming shook the world. The most well-known Pandaren are the Brewmasters, who travel the world seeking the perfect drinks and hoping to create their own time-honored recipes. These Pandaren lead some to believe that all Pandaren are merely Brewmasters and have no fighting skill, but such is not the case. Also, Brewmasters have fighting skill. Their race is peaceful, though, it is true, and their cultural values 
uh, ale and other spirits, as in all things, pander and strive for perfection in whatever their profession. Pandaren boasts several unique types of individual who draw upon their culture's history. Brewmasters are one such type, but the race also includes war dancers, agile fighters who spin, leap, tumble, and slay their foes with delicate weapons called Shoktani swords. Pandaren geomancers tap into the magic of earth and stone, while Sh Shotopans lead their Shaudins, or clans. Yeah, and there's monks. The peaceful and friendly, friendly Pandaren prefer diplomacy to combat, but when battle calls, they are fierce and deadly. Pandaren are graceful and intelligent fighters. Their philosophers and tacticians have written treaties on military protocol and strategy, and their war dancers espouse certain philosophies to which Pandaren cling. Pandaren begin combat defensively, using dodge and combat expertise to test their opponent's prowess, then adjust their tactics accordingly. They flee or surrender if they're outmatched. The, um, they can also be played as characters. A few Pandaren leave Pandaria, but those who do invariably leave their mark on the outer world. Some adventure to see other lands and experience other people, others because it expands their minds and supports their philosophy. Some Pandaren travel to broaden their horizons and witness new versions of their specialties. Pandaren warriors adventure to observe new fighting styles, and Pandaren shaman wish to see new spells and study the ways of other races, how that they how they commune with spirits. Perhaps the most famous Pandaren adventurers are brewmasters who travel the world seeking to perfect their alcoholic beverages. All right, we have Snapdragons. This is something from Warcraft 3, uh, challenge rating 4, level 4. If a dog were a reptile, it would look something like this. This long, wiry, lizard-like creature runs with an undulating grace reminiscent of a snake. Its head is also snake-like, and a red tongue darts from its mouth. It is obviously amphibious, with a red fin-like ridge extending down its spine. Large fins flare from its head and tail. Uh, also, you know, you fight things like that in BFA and stuff, too. You can ride, you can get a mount like that. Predators are able to spit painful acid. Snapdragons appear as trained beasts in many Naga armies. In the wild, snapdragons dwell along tropical coasts, entering the water to lay in wait for prey. When they sense it coming near, they rise and spit acid until the prey falls. The snapdragon then ambles over and feasts on the partially liquefied meal. Many snapdragons exist in the South Seas where they are a danger. All avoid them except the Naga who train the beasts for war. Snapdragons spend much of their time on land, where their acetic spit is effective, but use the water to surprise prey and move quickly through their territory. Snapdragons attack from ambush. They use watery environments to conceal their presence and to move where they can attack prey from the most advantageous places. They spit at their prey repeatedly and retreat from attackers only to circle around and try again. They bite only if quartered, cornered, or underwater. Okay, a spiderling swarm. Oh my gosh, like we did on the episode the other day with Farrakh, like just fighting those spiderling swarms. So annoying. Um, they have their level five as a swarm. A swarm of small spider-like creatures skitters across the ground. Though they resemble spiders, they clearly are not. Their bodies are elongated and two of their eight limbs are spindly arms. Their green compound eyes glitter in hunger. Spiderlings are young and voracious Nerubians. While not nearly as intelligent as adult Nerubians, spiderlings are still dangerous. In fact, when they gather in swarms, which they often do, they're more dangerous than Nerubian workers. Adult Nerubians carry their young around their lairs. Up to around a dozen spiderlings cling to the adult's body. Nerubians leave the spiderlings in their lair when they move to confront enemies, but foes who clash with Nerubians in their tunnels may find themselves confronting a spiderling swarm. Nerubians are spiderlings for about three years. Over this time, they grow from the tiny spiderlings presented here, gradually attaining small size. At this point, they are adult Nerubians with a single hit die, and are that's presented in Chapter 2. Like young creatures of other races, spiderlings have a limited command and understanding of their native language, Nerubian. Spiderling swarms are almost always attached to adults. The only other way an adventurer can reasonably expect to run into a spiderling swarm is in a Nerubian incubation chamber. Spiderlings follow the commands of other Nerubians, particularly the adult to which they are attached. Once the Nerubians have destroyed or routed all opponents, the spiderlings feed. They have a distraction trait as well. That's just due to their nature of being a swarm. It makes it harder to do things around them. Okay, the tube worm. Level 11. A thick emerald colored hide forms this creature's monstrous body but countless tiny scales of dark blue and deep purple shades covers its serpentine skin. These form a tough natural armor that shimmers iridescently whenever light shines upon it. Tube worm are serpent-like creatures that live on the ocean floor. Occasionally, Naga capture and train tube worm to 
to serve them as defenders, particularly in Najatar, but this strategy is not widespread. Naga referred to these tamed tube worms as tidal guardians. Tube worms thrive in heated, sulfur-rich, acetic waters. Heated gas emerges from thermal vents in some areas, and tube worm consume this gas and convert it into nutrients. One such area is the pillar deep in the eye. On first sighting this area, an undersea explorer sees enormous pillars rising from the ocean floor. Closer inspection, however, reveals that these pillars are tube worm grown to enormous size in these rich waters. Tube worm protect the tubes in which they live in the surrounding area. Some varieties spit acid and or grapple foes. The tube worm presented here is one such creature that can do it all. A real renaissance tube worm. I think Tuscar is our last one. Um, I mean, yeah, it could be a playable character race as well. It's a level one creature because it's basically like a generic stat. Yeah, this is our last one of the of the episode. This squat, muscular humanoid has a face that resembles that of a walrus, blunt and almost hairless with two long tusks that extend down. Red and blue designs adorn his tusks and he wears a thick oilskin jacket. Tuskar are sturdy humanoids adapted to the cold. I still think we need them as playable characters. They live in Northrend, where their society revolves around fishing and whaling. They are a friendly people, but wage constant battle against the Drakari ice trolls and Nerubians. So far, the Tuskar avoid the scourge, but they know that eventually they will be forced to fight or flee. Tuskar are excellent fishermen and whalers, and their economy is based upon these skills. They dwell along Northrend's coasts. They do not spend time and effort organizing their communities. Instead, villages arise out of a need to coordinate efforts at fishing, animal husbandry, and defense, rather than out of politics. The center of their civilization is Kaskala, a cluster of villages in the Borean tundra. Tuskar shaman influence the weather, cure the sick, and help with the gathering of food. Being skilled at fishing or whaling is considered evidence of good morals in Tuskar society, whereas poor fishing is seen as evidence of some moral deficiency. The Tuskar picture of the afterlife as a place with safe waters, plentiful catches, and no enemies. I'm going to take a pause real quick because I'm having thoughts in my head. So the Tuskar would be a cool playable race, right? And we, what are we going to do? Obviously, work every two years, they got to come out with a new expansion. That's what they do. Um, they have tried revamping. They've tried alternate reality dimensions. Both of those two are much more controversial. They've had the, mo the, the greatest success when they just introduce new zones that they can kind of shoehorn in. So when you did this with, say, Shadowlands, cool, you just make a whole nother zone. Same thing with Outland, it actually worked pretty well. You're not kind of on Azeroth. It's a little bit harder to keep squeezing in like, oh, uh, Northrend's been there all, all the time. Okay, Pandaria has been there. Well, those things were tied in some, to some of the older lore, but we're running out of stuff like that too. Um, like when you did the Broken Shore, those, those islands from Legion, that was a much tougher sell, or at least that's, that's hard. BFA. The fact that we're just now getting to explore these these islands okay so there's just we're running out of places i'm thinking that we can reference and that's why we, they had to make up the dragon isles there's little to no reference perhaps no reference ever they basically just made up this set of islands it's like hey this has just been there the whole time you know we're just do a little hand waving about that um but i wonder how creative could they get because what was the most i would say if you had to poll everyone there's there's probably the winner of that poll for best expansion and coolest zone ever is probably Northrend. Um, and maybe that's me with, with my own biases because that's how I feel. But could we somehow have an alternate Northrend? Like, could there be a Lich King revival or a Burning Crusade something or Illidan did something over there and it created like a subcontinent off Northrend. It split off, not an alternate Northrend, but almost like just a hunk of, hunk of ice that was recreated. Um, or something and it led to the Tuscar these are just little nascent ideas uh, they just have to kind of get creative or something they could they could do like the upside down upside down version you could do that they sort of kind of did that with the Dragon Isles where we have the underground version um, and I have thought that for a little while that you could essentially open the world up completely by making underground versions an, a whole underground world of some of these other places like even that, a world that was so big it had its own kind of sun. Um, the family is the Tuscar's primary social structure. The action of one family member is the responsibility of the entire group. 
Marriage occurs for a Tuscar man when he can support a wife, and for a Tuscar woman, as soon as she reaches puberty. Tuscar law requires all Tuscar to help supply the community with food, clothing, and other necessities. Also, all Tuscar must contribute to the defense of their villages. Punishment is generally mild and involves loss of social standing through ridicule or ostracism. However, when someone takes a Tuscar's life, blood vengeance is the only allowable response. They speak Tuscar in common. Tuscar are peaceable but show little mercy to ice trolls, Nerubians, or anyone else they consider their enemies. They enter warfare as much as they do uh, their fishing and whaling efforts. They prefer to cast nets upon their enemy and then fight the trap target with spears. They can also make good heroes. While few Tuscar leave their villages and families, a few are driven to explore the world or to take more direct action against the Scourge, the, whose depredations the Tuscar see but do not combat. Tuscar are good-hearted folk who are devoted to their friends. A Tuscar makes friends easily, but it takes a long time for him to consider a group of friends the equivalent of his family. When he does, though, they have his loyalty for life. Tuscar tend to be soldiers and experts, but the few who go adventuring often take levels in Barbarian, Scout, or Shaman. That's it, guys. We've done it. We have another episode in the pipe, 5x5. Five five. Only one Dungeons & Dragons episode left. Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. I look forward to seeing you next time on the next episode of Lore of Warcraft.